Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation. Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. The Fidelco Group, Fedway Associates. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. Kessler Foundation, changing the lives of people with disabilities. And by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger, powering NJ.com. And by Commerce Magazine. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. (laughs) I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. I want to introduce you to a good friend of ours that we want to have on the show for a while. He's uh, Jim McHugh. How are you doing, Jim? Steve, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, too. Oh, it's uh, our pleasure. Um, Jim, you and I not only are golf partners, and uh, you beat me on a regular basis, but that's not the reason you're here. You're here to talk about um, your brother, John, who uh, fought very bravely for this country, um, but on May 18th, 2010, gave up his life for this country fighting in Afghanistan. Correct. Talk to us. Uh, he, John was... Uh a uh, colonel in the U.S. Army, uh, got deployed to, he was stationed out of uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, the Battle Command and Preparation Center, and his, his uh, role was to kind of go out like a coach would go scout an opponent and see what the tactics were going on or, or the, what was going on on the field, and then come back and change the game plan for those mm-hmm. who were going to be deployed right uh, a little bit later. Right Let's right picture there. him with uh, General David Petraeus at the time from Kuwait. Right. And uh, so he was over there on one of his missions to kind of see what's going on. Uh, on the ground, and then he would come back, and uh, the next group to be deployed at the time was coming from Fort Drum, New York, and he would adjust the training regiments here to be consistent with what the tactics were on the ground. And uh, he arrived in Kabul, Afghanistan, and typically they would fly from the airport to uh, Bagram Air Base, where, where they were headquartered, and a couple days prior to his arrival, the Bagram airfields were, were bombed and were not, no longer accessible, so they had a convoy from the Kabul airport to, uh, to heading to his, uh, his base. And a suicide bomber saw this army convoy, drove up next to the convoy and set off about 2,000 pounds of explosives. And my brother, four other U.S. soldiers were killed, um, a colonel from uh, the Canadian Army and 17 civilians. Describe, um, your brother John was 46? 46. 46 when he passed. He had uh, how many children? Five. Five. And a grandchild. He did. He got to know his granddaughter for about a month prior to his deployment over to uh, Kabul. Brothers and sisters on your end? I have a a younger brother, Frank, who's two years younger than me, and I have an older sister. Mm -hmm. And John was the fourth in the family. And your mom and dad there, too. Mom and dad, they're still still hanging in there, too. They're still alive. I remember um, when, I remember when, when John passed and the reaction on the part of those who are in your world and 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 and, and, and John's world and all these different connections the reaction was overwhelming um, I want you to describe for folks who John was and the way he lived his life which is why you are here today yeah. and part of a series that we are doing just really remembering those who have given their lives and and trying to remember not just who they were and why they're important but who they leave behind yeah yeah, and as you mentioned, he was married and, uh, and had five children. And, you know, I think over time, especially when we get, you know, when the United States is involved in a conflict that you know, maybe extend 10, 12 years, we sort of become desensitized to the headlines. Sure. You know, we read a story and, and hear, you know, a couple servicemen killed, and it's like, that's a shame, but we really don't stop and think about what's behind that story. And it is a real family. It's a father of five. He's his son, Michael. My nephew Michael, also uh, in the Army, he was deployed in Baghdad at the time of the news of his father's passing. Um, My niece Kelly just graduated Kansas State. She's a sports editor for the Kansas State newspaper. Uh, Kristen, uh, the middle daughter, she's at Liberty University in uh, in Virginia studying Christian counseling. Uh, Maggie just turned 15, is in high school, just got getting her driver's permit down in Alabama. Mm. And David is uh, is eight, the youngest in the family. 
And uh, John would like to know too that he also just re not too long ago had a second granddaughter wow. uh, by his son Michael. Uh, so there's a real family behind these headlines. And John was a guy that was really steeped in, in three things. Uh, family, there was no doubt it, his family came first and everything. Uh, his faith, he had a tremendous strong faith in God. And, uh, and he loved the United States Army. And on top of that, he was, uh, he was a pretty good athlete over the years, too. Loved to play sports. He was all, I think he was all-state soccer from here in the state of New Jersey. And either all-county and, and second-team all-state in, in baseball. He was a pretty good baseball catcher back then, too. It's interesting. This series is called uh, Aptly Gone But uh, Not Forgotten. And this is the first of a series of conversations we're having with family members of uh, United States um, military men and women who we have lost in service to the country. Um, and we do forget too quickly. And we're going to try not to do that here by talking to people like Jim. And, and because Jim and I have a close personal relationship, it was easy to have you come in. But the other part of this, Jim, is that there are organizations out there that fight every day to, to, to not forget. And I want you to talk about two of them. Sure. And we're going to put up uh, Jackie Cook, our producer, if you could. Let's, let's put up the website that you were talking about, the first one. Yeah, Gold Star Mothers. Gold Star Mothers, yeah. go ahead. Um, president of the Gold Star Mothers of New Jersey, uh, Judy Tapper. A uh, tremendous lady. Uh, her son was a, was a Navy SEAL uh, who was uh, taken way too soon. And she's tried to take this experience and, and, and become um, a resource for other mothers who have lost children, mm. son or daughter, and become a resource for, to provide any sort of additional support services uh, that these families have. What do they need, uh, Jim? Uh, I think they need uh, reassurance at times. I think they need to constantly uh, hear that their son or daughter uh, will not be forgotten. Do they think uh, we have forgotten them? Um, maybe at times. I can't say consistently across the board whether they do or not, because I think perhaps in the past, you know, when in a different political environment, maybe in the but 60s your, and your 70s. Your brother's family. Um, your, they John's have, family. Do you think John's brother's family thinks? I mean, you know them best. They are your nieces, nephews, your sister-in-law, and your, your mom, your dad, right. you. Do you think, does your family think that we as a country have forgotten? Uh, I do not think that. Uh, and I do, do not think my family thinks that way. Um, my brother was also a West Point graduate and a colonel. Um, so he had many more years experience. But um, I don't know what the family reaction is to, let's say, uh, you know, a, a very young service person, mm. or much younger, with less experience. I can't vouch for what they may be going through. Um, but the fact that these you know, organizations are out there to help you, um, I, I think, are a great source of comfort during times. And people times. should use them. Absolutely, they should. Uh, they provide, you know, they, um, the Gold Star Moms sponsor something uh, last Sunday in, in September every year uh, called the New Jersey Run for the Fallen, where they have servicemen for each branch of the service run from Cape May to the Vietnam Memorial at the, mm -hmm. uh, at the Art Center. And they stop at one mile every, long, every mile along the way, they stop and honor another fallen from New Jersey. So families can actually see where their family member's monument is, and the, and the, the soldiers will stop on their run, honor the family, thank you mm -hmm. for your service, and then they're off to the next mile. And it's done over, over a full weekend, the last of September. It's, it's great. Jim, why, um, you and I have had this conversation for a while, you know? Why did you want to do the show, other than the fact that I asked you? Uh, c because I'm proud, of, I'm proud of my brother. Um, um, I'm the oldest in the family, oldest brother in the family. And you always think as the oldest brother, there's five and a half years age difference. You, know, you, you want to protect your little brother. Uh, he was always What's the youngest sure around. Right That's John on the, on the upper right. <laughs> uh, myself, my brother Frank, and my sister. Um, and you always want to protect your younger brother. And so here, um, a situation where at 18 years old, you know, he goes off and becomes part of a different family. He goes up to the military academy and where he's part of the, you know, the McHugh family and, and hanging out in the neighborhood and playing ball and doing all that stuff. He's now part of a different family. And it becomes a much different relationship once he becomes part of, of the military academy family and the army family. And so you're still able to maintain those relationships. Um, but you realize maybe what you want to do to protect your brother, you're not in control of that anymore. Mm. Somebody else is. Um, but I will never forget him. He's, uh, uh, he'll always be in my thoughts. I think of him every day. Um, I, I talk to him every day. You do? And, yeah, I do. I do. And um, right there on your right wrist, you have that, and I got you to give me one of those, and I wear mine every day as well. Yep. Show us folks what that is. Bob yep. Morris, our 
Can we get this kip shooting over here? Can we it's, get this? Uh, it, it's just called a hero bracelet where I just, uh, uh, it's got his name on it, uh, New Jersey, Army, and then uh, his, uh, his passing on May 18th of, of 2010. You know, some, I don't know. Um, we see it. You know, people think of, you try to think, you know, are there other messages or, or, or uh, is, there, is there a higher authority governing things? Uh, and, and I certainly believe it is the case. But um, it's been an interesting series of events around the date, May 18th. You know, he was killed May 18th, 2010. Um, we have the funeral out. He's buried out in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where he was deployed from. And we go back to his house after the funeral service there, and we open up his yearbook, class of 86, senior yearbook at West Point, his senior portrait's on page 518. Wow. And most recently, my older son was looking for an apartment, and he got turned down for one in West Orange, got to his apartment, got uh, approved for an apartment in Morristown. The address is number 518. When did his daughter graduate? Uh, she graduated this past uh, May, on May 18th. I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, Something it, about that date. Yeah. You think John's looking down? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind he is. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's absolutely no doubt. I think he, uh, yeah, he, he was a tremendous soccer fan. I think yeah. uh, he'll be looking down at the World Cup this, this year in Brazil, <laughs> watching it. Um, the big Bayern Munich uh, 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 rooter for, uh, in the German League. He's proud of his big brother, I know that. Um, we try, you know, we, we yeah. try to keep his honor and, and his thoughts and his memory alive. Hey, Jim, I want to thank you for being with us. Steve, I, I appreciate the opportunity and, uh, you know, to all the other families that, are, that are, have had, had this experience. Uh, on behalf of the McHugh family, uh, you will never be forgotten, and, and we thank you for your, your son or daughter's service. It's the other way around. We owe your family, we owe all the families who have given so much, uh, gone but definitely not forgotten in uh, the first of many interviews. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Steve. Okay, Appreciate thank it. you, buddy. Okay, stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Steve Adubato here at the Hyatt in New Brunswick. We are recognizing the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Community and Mental Health Act of 1963. President John F. Kennedy signed that law. It changed forever the way those who are dealing with behavioral mental health issues are being treated. One of the experts we're talking to today is Dr. Anthony DeFabio, President and Chief Executive Officer of an organization called Robbins Nest, good to see you, doctor. First, and then tell folks what Robin's Nest is. Sure. So, very good to see you, and thank you for taking the time to talk about this incredibly important topic. Um, Robin's Nest is a children and family service agency. We provide over 50 programs and services throughout South Jersey, um, the southern seven counties of Jersey, and they range everywhere from residential programs, supportive housing. We do a lot of child welfare programs, certainly to this topic, behavioral health, and also mm. prevention services as well. Doctor, if someone were to say, okay, um, back in 63, 50 years ago, uh, President Kennedy signs the Community Mental Health Act. What is the connection between the signing of that law, the deinstitutionalizing, if you will, for those who are dealing with mental illness, trying to have them be more in the community, and the creation of an organization like Robin's Nest? Absolutely. The, quite honestly, if it wasn't for that act, there might not be a Robin's Nest. How so? Well, because it really was transformative. To, to your question's point, it ushered in a whole new way of, of understanding mental health and of treating mental health. And so before that, it was really seen as something that was very difficult to treat and really something that required hospitalization and even institutionalization. Um, with the passage of that bill, we acknowledge that there's more we can, should, and must do within our communities. And it ushered in a whole new way of understanding mental health and certainly of treating mental health. Give us an example, doctor. So if someone says, okay, I, I, I'm logging on the Robin's Nest website. I want to find out what they do. And then they'll see all sorts of services. But give us a concrete example, a visceral, you know, real example, human example of how you're helping children, families who are dealing with these issues in a way that people can say, oh, that's important. Yeah. Well, you know, there still is a legacy of fear, I think largely because of the history of mental health and mental health treatment. So when families a lot of times engage Robin's Nest, they're almost afraid of that hospital. And so 
what we talk about at Robinsonist is we're about children and families, but we're not Disney World. If someone reaches out to us, they're at a crossroads in life we would not wish upon anyone. They're scared, they're worried, they feel they've lost control, they're powerless, they don't know what's going to happen. And in many instances, they're afraid that their child is going to be arrested or hospitalized. And we have the, the, the privilege of being able to talk to them and look them in the eye and say, I know you're scared, I know you're worried, but there's a lot of things that we can do. And what it's going to start with is you just coming in and having an outpatient appointment. And us what does that mean to folks? They may not understand exactly what that outpatient appointment means. Well, what it means is you don't have to call 911. You don't have to go to the emergency room. You don't have to lock your door and wonder what's going to happen in another day in another week. What it means is that you're talking to someone who, who their confidence and passion on the phone is already giving them hope that healing is going to take place. And when we say, you know what, we'll have you come in, you can come in in a few days or in a week, and we sit down and talk to them about what's going on and we help them to understand that this affects one out of every four, one out of every five people. This is not something that you, you have to struggle with alone. And this is not something that we're just gonna lock you guys away in a place like they would have done even 50 years ago. This is something that, you know, we have treatment now where we can really work with you and your family and your child to get you to a much better place. But doctor, also at the same time, for those of us who in fact have dealt with uh, mental health, behavioral health issues in our own families. There are times when there are crisis related issues and, and Robin's Nest does in fact have a crisis management plan. Talk about that. Sure, so crisis for us, it, again, it's an opportunity to do something in a different- Crisis is an opportunity? Crisis is a tremendous opportunity because crisis is the, where you have the benefit of an experience that you can immediately latch on with and engage that family with. And you can say, okay, so we're seeing evidence of what you're telling. If you tell us two weeks later, a month later, a year later, we're trying to understand it, but if we have staff who within one hour of that phone call are in your house with you mm -hmm. and with your child, and we're engaging and talking and listening and seeing and hearing and experiencing it with you, we have an opportunity not only to de-escalate the situation, so you're not going to an emergency room, so you're not calling the police, but we have an opportunity to be able to put together an assessment based on that, that real world observation of what was going on. And so we now are able to de-escalate, assess, and then put them up in services that have everything to do with getting them to a, a better path more quickly. So crisis is an opportunity. I want to ask you something. Um, we've talked to a whole range of people here. Again, we're here at the 50th anniversary, uh, the folks that perform care and other uh, sponsors of this event. Um, really got together the advocates, the experts, the leaders in the behavioral mental health community to recognize the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Community Mental Health Act of 1963 signed by President John F. Kennedy. But a lot of the folks we've talked to who are frankly considerably older and more experienced than you are, have talked about their commitment, their passion for this issue and the people you serve. Where does yours come from? You know what, maybe I could tell you a story to make the point. So when I was at Vanderbilt University, I remember my first placement was in an inpatient unit. And it was my first day at that inpatient unit and my supervisor came up and he said, okay, before we do anything else, I want to get a sense of your clinical skills. He said, look in that room and you see that person right there? I want you to take the next few minutes to observe that person and I want you to report to me on what your impressions are. I said, absolutely. So I'd studied my abnormal psych, I'd read the textbooks, I'm there, I'm observing. He comes back a few minutes later, like he said, and he says, so what do you think? I said, well, he's somewhat withdrawn and isolated, so he's not really socially engaged, he's sitting down, he's not moving that much, so you know, he's, he's not necessarily catatonic, but from a psychomotor perspective, he's, he's pretty flat. Um, he's really hyper-focused on this TV and not really engaging in eye contact or others. And I went through this, he says, okay, that's really great. Very, very good, you obviously know your, your diagnoses. What would you say he is? I said, well, I think he's a little internally preoccupied. I think he probably has maybe a schizophrenia, maybe a mood component to it. He said, okay, that's a staff person on break. And the message- Wait, It was a staff was person a staff person working on, on the team? He, no, unbeknownst to him, he was just on break watching TV. The lesson for me was, if you don't have a system of care, we will apply our intellect and our experience to fit a person into whatever level of care we have. You will use that hammer to put in that thumbtack. So for me, while I wasn't alive for many years until after the passage of this, the, in 63. In 63. Thanks for making the rest of us feel older. Go ahead. <laughs> well, but, but it's still relevant, and you still see examples of it on a regular basis. You, know, you love what you do, don't you? I love what I do, absolutely. I'm very fortunate. What about the people you serve? One minute left. In many respects, I think that I learn more from the people we serve than anyone else out there. They, their resilience, their strength of will and character, 
their humble willingness to look you in the eye and tell you some of the most vulnerable things about them and their families, um, their courage to address and work on and try and improve their own position and a family's position in life. Um, I love going to work. I love going home. I'm very fortunate in life. Thank you for the work you do, doctor. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Reverend Trevor Rubing is executive director of New City Kids. How you doing? Good. Good. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. We're based in Jersey City, New Jersey. Yes. And uh, your organization empowers kids and teens through academic, musical, spiritual, and leadership development, right? Right. Impressive statistic. 100% of uh, the teens that you have are seniors in high school that actually attend college. Yeah. How does that happen? <laughs> Well, uh, it's part of a whole comprehensive approach to leadership development that starts when a child is six years old and we develop a culture really of college readiness, college attendance, and a, a college mindset. It's so, an after school program? Yeah, it starts as an after school program. It's after school coupled with a, a teen component. And so teenagers come to the table with a, some, some needs and children come with a different need. And what we found is when you put these two needs together, uh, you can really release a lot of energy for transformation. So we have uh, probably about 150 teenagers come in June to try out for the internship. And to try out? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so it's three days where uh, we do resume writing workshops and how to interview and how to get promoted. And at the end of the three days, we have to pick 60 of these teens to then work all of our programs incredibly competitive. Yeah, it's competitive, but we also uh, want to see that the kids are I interested and invested in their own transformation process. What are the keys to making this work? Well, what we do is we say this is a paid internship. So that's the hook. For them, they're coming at first because it's a job. Yes. But that, that job is really a platform on which we deliver a whole range of services. So academic support to the teens, life skills training, professional visits, spiritual development, emotional. And for example, in order to keep their job, they've got to maintain a, a C average or better. If they get one C, they get knocked down to three days a week. And then they have to go to tutoring. But that sets up the next thing, which is they um, are invited to come to SAT class. And that if they pass that, then they get to go on a college tour. And going on a college tour brings them on a college campus. And for the first time, for many of them, they're around people who look like them and, and are from the same background, but who are excited about mm -hmm. learning, excited about college. And that plants a seed and, again, kind of reinforces that college culture. Where would you get the idea for this? <laughs> I've stolen most of our ideas from uh, friends of mine. So it's a... Uh, Urban Promise in Camden, New Jersey, is one ministry where we've really... Um, Why do you call it a ministry? It's a... It's, for most of these places, it's inspired by a love for God and a feeling like uh, my life has been changed and I've been given a gift and I want my life to count and give that gift back. And so it's a service. The word ministry is really uh, from the word to serve. And so that's, that's how we view it. We, we want to have our lives be an offering to kids and to make a difference. Where are you from originally? I'm from Michigan. Michigan to yeah. Jersey City, New Jersey. Yes. How's that happen? <laughs> well, my wife and I um, wife, met at Linda. seminary. Yeah, we met at seminary. We you met at seminary? Mm-hmm. In and Princeton, you, and New you Jersey. Said, okay, so you met in Princeton and you said, hey, why don't we check out Jersey City? No, we... Um, we dreamed together of how we could best use our lives to serve God and to make a difference in the world. And um, I did an internship in Patterson, and one thing led to another. And there was a need, really, in Jersey City, one of the most diverse cities in the country, but extremely high need and a lot of blight at the time. Sure. And um, so we originally came to start a church, but as time went on, we found that if we're going to make a difference, we needed to work with kids and teach them tangible skills. We're going to show some pictures, and as we do that, I want you to describe some of the 
specific, tangible skills, and we'll roll some of these shots. Sure. Talk about them. What are we, what are we talking about here? Yeah, so our after school center is not just a place to get homework done. We, uh, kids finish their homework in a half hour. So sure. what we do is we encode a whole lot of learning like times tables, geography, grammar, and we use music to wrap that content in a memorable way. So this is a slide of the kids wrapping um, some of the, uh, the content, whether it's grammar or geography. And the teens then teach the kids how to wrap. They get the content inside them and then they don't forget it when they need it. it. What do you got here? So this is an end of the year performance. Uh, every child at New City can learn bass, drums, voice, <laughs> or keyboard. And the teens, of course, are the teachers. So that's uh, one of our teenagers teaching voice class to the kids. Why is it important to have teens teaching kids? Well, the teens own the process. Own it. Yeah, they, they, they feel really proud of their classrooms. That's they, leadership. They design the classrooms. They put up the points. The kids are earning points. And if they get enough, they can get a free instrument. But the teenagers really feel like this is my classroom. And in the process, then they're learning skills about leadership, how to make a difference with your life, how to have long-term goals that come to fruition, how to have character, how to be held accountable to things. And those are the skills you need to get to college. And that's why we send 100% to college. Last question. Were you called to do this? Yeah, I, I really felt uh, a strong call from God. In fact, I would say pretty much everyone on our staff is giving up opportunities to earn more money and um, you know, be in a, probably a nicer context, a nicer city, a nicer uh, looking city. But um, they're coming because they feel like, I want to make a difference with my life, and I want to uh, be able to help kids experience transformation. You're confident that you're doing that, aren't you? Yes. I, I tell you, for the first 10 years, I wasn't quite as confident. But <laughs> <laughs> you're seeing it now. Yeah. Now um, yeah. Uh, we're sending the kids to college, and we're seeing them get and keep jobs. And, and, uh, keep it up. Yeah, thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Making you. a huge difference. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation, Cone Resnick, the Fidelco Group, Fedway Associates, New Jersey Sharing Network, Kessler Foundation, and by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.